This week on Behind the Pulpit, who is hungry out there? We're so glad you're with us here today. Pastor David, is lunchtime. Um, I didn't eat enough. My tummy's, tummy's rumbling, so we're going to see how long we spend on this podcast today. How, how are you feeling? Did you get enough food for lunch? This is very Winnie the Pooh right there. <laughs> Your tummy's rumbling? You want me to get you some honey? <laughs> <laughs> I, need more, I need more than honey, man. It's What's going on here? <laughs> This I'm feeling like a weird stuff. Feeling like I need a, a, a quarter pounder or a Big Mac. What do you think? <laughs> I'm always down for number one. Where you <laughs> is gonna, that what it is? The Big Mac number one. We're gonna get the Big Mac from Bob. Do you want that medium? By the way, super I, I will mention there. Did you uh, down here in in Sterling, down the road from us, there was a Taco Bell that opened up next no to the way. Burger King. So when? Taco Bell. Where? When? Down next to the Burger this King. Just happened. It just opened up in the last couple of weeks. They've been building it. I've been, been over there. Suspense, but there's a Taco Bell. Just so oh you know. Oh, my word. In case you're hungry after lunch. Um, after this podcast. Let's <laughs> go, man. We've we taken, we taken a trip. Yo quiero Taco Bell. You right? know, Noah and, I, <laughs> Noah and I discovered today that neither of us have ever had Taco Bell. What? You've never had Taco Bell? No, Noah and, and I... never have, will. Yeah, I don't... <laughs> <laughs> That's a hard. This is no. the same time where okay. I found out Noah has never had sushi, and he also said that he never will. We're gonna work on that one, though. <laughs> You've never had sushi, never had it. Okay, all right. Well, I remember the first time that I took uh, Scott Gunderson. I'm gonna give him a shout out today. I took him to have sushi, and uh, the faces he made uh, were quite uh, were were quite memorable. <laughs> Let's just say he's not gone back to have any more after that. <laughs> So anyway, we're glad you're joining us for Behind the Pulpit today. Uh, this is always a rousing uh, podcast. I'm uh, roused. We, we we even have some people that are uh, that are following us. I think on on uh, on uh, on the YouTube's now, Pastor Dave. So if you're new with us, you should go and. Uh, like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. Is that, is that how we do it? Like, subscribe, leave us a comment. Yes, like, subscribe. Like Don't just this. comment that you think that your view of the end times is correct. Also, subscribe to our page and like the video as well. This is true. So yeah. last week, this was, this was, we didn't get into the news, but last week, the sermon I, I did on Revelation Blew 6. Blew up, man. Like a thousand fold what we normally get on, on, the, uh, on the messages. So I think this week, Pastor Days might jump up to 2,000. Or hope so. And Did uh, you start getting like private messaging for like contracts and stuff like that. I didn't get no, I didn't get that, but we did get a lot of comments on that. We had YouTube a pull out on the rapture. People always have lots of opinions on the rapture, Pastor Dave. So um, I think we're I think we've raptured ourselves out. <laughs> <laughs> I raptured kind myself of, out. Last week. We got some good co- got some good feedback <laughs> on that on your little rapture last week, Pastor yeah, Dave. Yeah, we did. Tim, how did, did you do the did like how that. did you do the puff of smoke? How did you do the special it effects? Lo- there, it, was, man? it looked like Pastor Dave blew up. Is that, that what it's going to be? Exactly the, the way that Kirk like, Cameron says it was going to happen. I don't know, just a little movie magic. wasn't that difficult. All right. But... <laughs> well, did guys, anyway, did you guys see the Left Behind movie with Kirk Cameron? I did not. No, Tim. No, was that standard? No. You, well, he's he's not. And Noah? actually, didn't, never seen it. What? Really? I, think, I think my dad's an amillennialist, so I, he probably would have just kept that out of the household. It was like on the banned book list in the but, Yucas household. But weren't you one that was telling me that that he's now a post millennialist? He, so he wouldn't. Yeah. He wouldn't, so that uh, entire series was based on classical dispensationalism. Left Behind, uh-huh. you know, whatever nine, ten volumes of books or whatever it was, and then a movie series. <laughs> he was like the star. Yes. He's not premillennial or pre-tribulational anymore. He's changing now to a post-millennial. <laughs> so, Kirk well, Cameron. Fortunately, he's still in the movie, so he's got to, I guess, answer for that. But that's a good like yeah. segue to what we want to talk about a little bit later. So, like, it's okay to adjust your yes, thinking yes. and adjust your view, and, and it's actually okay just to be undecided. We're learning together. Yeah. Well, you told us in the message this week that you're you, you were you were wrestling with some stuff. So did we'll, I say that? You did. Out Something loud. Like that. You did. That was that was recorded. I so. am. <laughs> it's true. It's so, true. Well, I'm we'll, struggling. We'll dive into that a little bit later on. But before we get there, Diving. let's talk about some present day issues. So we do have an election coming up, Pastor Dave. Uh, there's an election in a couple. Did you know there's an election <laughs> coming up in a few weeks? You mentioned that last week. I just, I just. <laughs> what? Nobody's even it's, said it's, anything, and I'm like behind i don't think there's any undecided folks out there right now but there might be some people that are wrestling with the election stuff i don't know um yes single-handedly the behind the pulpit <laughs> listeners are the undecided folks that we, <laughs> all you behind the pulpit listeners in door county wisconsin that are that are watching this episode right now we i saw comments from the philippines though last week so there might be some yeah. expatriates over in the get philippines. your write-in votes going <laughs> 
<laughs> it might be too late. But you know, this week, so I, I saw yesterday that uh, uh, Trump, uh, President Trump, went and worked at McDonald's. Oh yeah, he was making some French fries. Uh, so <laughs> I don't know what to make of that, but that that happened this week. That um, is the true appeal to the blue collar workers amongst us. It it yes. Yeah, so. Although that's not winning him any points with me because I worked at Burger King. Oh. So when I was sixteen, seventeen, that was a political miscalculation. That is a rival. So yeah. if you want my allegiance, man. You Although I've heard wrong. he likes McDonald's. Like he he orders people Big Macs all the time. <laughs> all the <laughs> so time. I can't. <laughs> choice now that, uh, that might get me all right so well, that wasn't the news guy. story so uh there's a bigger news story so let's go to our in the news segment all right here's the bigger news story pastor dave and i i know you're a big basketball fan and a football fan but let's talk baseball because the world series is coming up this weekend and the new york yankees are going to the world series We're back for the first time since when? When was the last time they 2009. were there? Two thousand and nine. Is it really been that long? Two thousand and nine. Oh, first my, time. And I, I also, remember. I also we wanted we want to give our Mets fans out there some love too. It was really pulling for that for them. Uh, they they lost to the Dodgers yesterday. We really wanted a a New yeah, York so, win guaranteed here. <laughs> the reason I'm bringing this up because I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna give my wife a shout out here. So we're, we're gonna have some uh, controversy in our house because my wife is a Dodgers fan. I'm a Yankees fan. Our kids are pulling in either direction. It is the Yankees versus the Dodgers in the World Series this year. So there's gonna, it's like um, uh, I don't know. There's there's going to be some. Uh, it's some the World Series everyone wanted from like a from a baseball purist. New York, L.A., two biggest markets. It, it's it's happening. Are you going to watch the World Series, or do you care not at all about baseball? I haven't been totally following this year, and so, but there's nothing more American than the Yankees making it into the World Series. I think that's cool. It it makes true. me want to get that from a Cowboys fan. Apple wow. pie, and you know, um, you know, get some McDonald's. That's what it makes me want. <laughs> there we to go. Say. It, yeah. There's going to be a lot of Big Macs during the World Series. <laughs> I'm sure there is. <laughs> this <Yeah. week. laughs> Very good. Looking forward all to right, a good series. Go. So that's what's going on in the news, uh, and I don't really have a. A uh, a spin on that, other than to say that obviously God wants the Yankees to win. So oh, there man. you go. That's how you spread the gospel. Uh, <laughs> We're committing heresy on the uh, on the air here. Wait, wait, wait. Tim has a special jersey on. Today. Oh yeah. I feel oh. like we should feature that now that we're on. Shout out that? to all of our women sports fans. The New York Liberty won the W. Their first ever in 28 years the of being WNBA. a team won the WNBA championship over the Minnesota Lynx last night in overtime in a wow. winner take all game. Wow. It was amazing. It is uh, Caitlin Clark. Wow. Who does she play for? She plays for the Indiana Fever. Okay. So she did not win. No, she did not. Okay. But she won Rookie of the Year, I believe, unanimously, or just missed one vote or something like okay. that. Okay. Well, go New York. There we go. Boom. Uh, and that's it's your big sports. Apple. Maybe we should have called this sports moment rather than in the news. In the sports. All people that don't like sports are already tuned out. So maybe we <laughs> should like when, back to It's like when stuff. Noah and I did the show together. <laughs> <laughs> no pastors, no problem. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next, let's move on to the next segment. We got the book war. I, I, I feel like I I've been offering some book recommendations, Pastor Dave, and so it's some. your turn to carry the mantle. What's your definition of some? For the next few weeks. <laughs> some, some would be slightly more than a few, you know. <laughs> That's a relative term right there. I got one. All right, so in the sermon yesterday. I saw you walking in today with a stack of books. I saw So you too. could have recommended more. Well, listen. You, I heard you say 10 pounds. Per week. That's my that's my rule. So today we're doing R.C. Sproul's classic book, The Last Days According to Jesus. Subtitle, what did Jesus say about when he would return? When did Jesus say he would return? So this book, um, it's got high recommendations on the back by Ken Gentry. Even Bibsack from Dallas Seminary recommended this, which is actually interesting. So this came out, I don't know, 20 years ago. And I was more trained with dispensationalism, futurism, and then I read Sproul, and he introduced me to preterism for the very first time. That, were you doing this for the uh, before the all of a discourse in the summer, or was this in conjunction with that sermon preparation? No, I read that a long time ago, like 20 years ago. Uh, so, okay. yeah, it was it, my first introduction to preterism, and I thought it was like way, way, way groundbreaking, eye-opening. I had never heard of this thing. And um, it was almost like eschatology was futurism. That's just something right, I was always right. thinking. So he kind of opened my eyes to it. Uh, he has a way of teaching and writing that I find super clear. 
Mm-hmm. Some guys just know how to like put a sentence together and it makes sense. So he's just a yeah. teacher. Of course, he's passed away now, but this is one of his books that um, I thought was really helpful. If you were here yesterday and you heard my message about the seven trumpets, which, by the way, I think Tim might have a uh, special. Yeah, we wanted to work in the, the shofar horn. Can it get worked in right here? So that was me. Like Wait, you're not doing... even gonna you're not even gonna uh, acknowledge it. Well, that was me doing oh, doing the okay. trumpets. <laughs> I had one of these like animal horns, and I was trying my best to 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 blow it, and I was terrible, man. I just could not. <laughs> Have you ever tried to blow a trumpet? It's a special thing you do with your mouth. That's not like easy. It's not, you're easy. not out of yeah. practice. And I, I... I thought I was gonna pass out like on my patio trying to get noise out of this thing. And Michaela, my daughter, is trying to video me because I get get this video to Noah for the you know the Sunday morning <laughs> preview thing. And Michaela cannot like keep the camera still because she thinks I'm so ridiculous, and uh, she's laughing at me anyway. So I had some fun messing around with the trumpet as I was preparing the message. I did get into preterism a little bit to say, hey, here's another way to understand the seven trumpets. These are things that happen actually in the first century. We should consider this. Even if we're futurists, we mm-hmm. should consider that there could be another way to interpret these passages or a sort of a near fulfillment, far fulfillment way to think about some of these end times passages as well. So that's my recommendation today. R.C. Sproul, Last Days According to Jesus. Check it out. Very accessible. He also has a YouTube teaching series on this that's like eight videos long. Um, if you really want to do a deeper dive, that's available yeah. too. So that's my book recommendation for today. Check it out. I think you'll like it. So maybe it's worth stating that one of the ways that we decided we were going to do Revelation was not teaching it just from one perspective. And that may be frustrating for some and enlightening for others or groundbreaking for others, as you said. Um, so we're introducing people to kind of the, the menu of options that people have come up with, because we don't think this is a first tier issue. This is I would say probably a third tier issue. This is something that we can agree to disagree on. And in reality, the thing that I keep coming back to is I'm not sure that it it really changes the way that you would live today based on the view that you hold. We'll at some level find out when it actually happens. Or if we think it already happened, then it already happened. (laughs) So I don't know. Would Would you add to that? Yeah. So we want to talk about these. I think Dr. Bach in our podcast about this said there's sort of a... A conversation we can have on on the playground about these things, but we are united about the main things. Christ is returning. There's hope for this mm-hmm. world. There's mm-hmm. hope for our bodies, and He's going to judge the living and the dead. But how these things are arranged, good Bible believing Orthodox Evangelical Christians come to different views on that, and we want to explore some of those different views in each of the messages, just to expose ourselves to the variety of perspectives that are out there and help us to be stretched a little bit in our faith and in our understanding. Yeah. And this is particular it comes into particular focus in this middle section of Revelation. So I introduced that when we did chapter 6 to 8 and the seals. Um, although I kind of did more of a, what I call a modified futurist take on that. You did the preterism th- uh, focus yesterday. Um, chapters 12 to 13, um, and even you know, around there, it could be more of, uh, what I'm going to do is more of an idealist focus, that there's a lot of messages that are within there that are applicable for today, um, and we're not going to get so focused on who or who may not be the Antichrist and, and the beast and all that. Uh, there's messages in there that are very focused uh, and that can be helpful even in our day and age. So <clears throat> so we're trying to go back and forth and show the different ways you can take these these passages. Yeah. Um, so did you have a chart, by the way, that you want to share with us today? This is kind of where we do our chart citing. I um, had three charts in my message yesterday, so I didn't have a separate chart for behind the pulpit. Ooh, you know had... what? Do you want to do, you wanna do the, did you send them to Tim? Does he have them? I can, and we can talk about any one of them. Maybe we could talk a little bit about that tribulation chart that you had, because <clears throat> you, you mentioned two options. There's more. Uh, and we didn't get okay. to talk about the the length and nature of the tribulation last week, so maybe that can be part of our discussion today. So maybe let's let's we're gonna we're gonna have a forbearance on the chart citing and come back to that in a moment. Maybe once Tim has it, um, or you can insert it later on, Tim. In the meantime, let's do a little sermon recap to set the stage for our discussion. So, Pastor Dave, you were in as you mentioned the trumpets, Revelation eight through eleven, which was quite the chunk. You even had to skip over chapter 10, which maybe you can enlighten us on today. Um, but why don't you give us a quick summary of the of the trumpets? 60 seconds. 
give or take. All right. Revelation 8, 9, 10, 11 was the assignment. <laughs> Seven trumpets. Um, that was challenging. The first four kind of were rapid fire. Then five and six took a little longer with the demons and the locusts and stuff. Mm-hmm. And then the seventh. With the Apache was helicopters. Like, yeah, the helicopters. <laughs> The seventh was more triumphant. Uh, but so the seven trumpets are seven trumpets of judgment. They occur after the seals. Actually, the seventh seal sort of starts the seven trumpets, if you will. And so these were um, God's war. We use the trumpet as an image of a declaration or a warning that um, a battle is about to occur, kind of like how Joshua blew the trumpets before Jericho. And the question is like, who is Jericho here? But this was a warning that God was about to go to war against his enemies on behalf of God's people. And the seven trumpets were blown. And as each angel would blow their trumpet, a mm. different judgment or plague was cast upon the 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 earth. So the first four had mm. to do with uh, a lot of geological um, destruction and things that were occurring on the earth. And then the fifth and sixth... Uh, become very spiritual as there's a uh, an angelic being that opens up a certain shaft in a spiritual abyss and demons come pouring out of there <laughs> like I said like bats out of hell which by the way um, we got another video insert yeah insert. so I, I I recently had a trouble with pests in my house <laughs> and um, there were these bats that were in my attic making a mess and I would hear them at night and stuff <laughs> and so we had to call a uh, service to come out, and they come two different times. The first time they come, and they put these one-way doors where you can get the bat can get out, but they're not smart enough to figure out how to get back in. Mm-hmm. And they come out like around sunset, and then they hang out at night. They eat and stuff like that. They eat the bugs around your house. They're actually really good to have around. And in New Jersey, they're a protected species, so you can't like kill them. So they they let them out safely through these doors, and then they. Um, can't get back in to your attic. And so I was outside in the lawn watching the bats leave when they, when they were pushing them out. They would squirt them with just water. They don't like that. And then there was like, I was counting to see how many how many bats are up here. And I, I think there was 11. So I have a video of that. Uh, Tim will insert it right here. One, two, three, four, five, six, Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and that was pretty entertaining <laughs> to have that many bats in my attic that were fleeing. It's like you've seen that scene from Batman freedom. Begins where he goes down and the bats just swarm around him and he's like, "Ah!" Oh. Was, was that like, like, like you? That, they, were they swarming around you because yeah. you're it the new like Bruce that. Wayne? Yeah. I don't. I don't really like to be around them. Like if I'm outside and I start seeing the bats and I'm like on bonfire time, I'm like I, I, I'm I'm ready to go inside. <laughs> well, apparently want... they follow you inside and <laughs> yeah, kind of right. sneak up under your bed. They they can. <laughs> so the guy said uh, the after the bats left, which <laughs> so they got they got to the front door and my wife got the door. She's like, "Are you the Batman?" <laughs> which I thought was really funny. He's like, "I've been called worse." Anyway, so after they leave, they try to get back in and mm-hmm. the bat people are responsible to like stuff it up to make sure they can't get back in. They have this product called Stuff It where they make sure there's no crevices in the attic anymore. So anyway, they try to get back in your house and the guy goes, "Make sure you close all your windows at night because if they can't get back into the attic crevices, they will come in your downstairs if there's any open windows they remember that this is their house that they've sort of claimed as their territory <laughs> so you can't wow. like if you have windows wow. that you like keep cracked at night they will come speaking in speaking of the demon analogy right they right. they remember they, and they will come back like, that was their place like that this is their residence they bring seven more bats they do <laughs> they bring wow. friends and so like <laughs> That was enough. I just had to mention that to my wife only one time, and she never opened a window. Wow. Uh, so, anyway, I think we're Somebody open a window. Close that window. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, anyway, Good. we're done with bats. But when they escaped, man, they were they were, they were were flying like crazy. And Revelation 9 what is a like great, that. What a great analogy for what you were doing in Revelation. It was like, it was like your own apocalypse in your it house. Wa- it was. <laughs> So Revelation 9, the abyss is open, the smoke comes out, these locust creatures come flying out everywhere, and they go swarming all over the nation of Israel. And I thought that that was, you know, when I was a futurist, I thought maybe those were helicopters and 
then I started reading some other stuff and I started thinking, wow, the description that Josephus gave of the craziness and the lunacy that was occurring during the siege of Jerusalem seemed demonic in nature. There was these people yeah. running around killing people and dressing up like the opposite gender and it was it was really a strange erratic behavior happening as the Jews were having their city destroyed. So, um preterists say that was the locust plague that happened and there was this demon possession thing. And then there's an interlude. Man, this is mm -hmm. way more than 60 seconds. So then there's an interlude, chapters 10 and 11 are an interlude. Chapter 10, you have this like little scroll and this angel that's got one foot on the land and the sea and the, the angel's taking an oath and there's seven thunders and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. he hears something and God says, don't write it down. And then um, swears that this prophecy will come true and there won't be a delay. And then there's chapter 11. Yeah. Chapter 11 is, I, I read, I don't know if this is totally accurate, but I read, this is the most disputed chapter in the book of Revelation in terms of different views on stuff. So what is the temple? Yeah. What is the outer court? What are the right. two witnesses? Uh, who are they? What, where do they prophesy? Who are they witnessing to? And then mm -hmm. how do they mm -hmm. die? And then what happens after they die? Their bodies lay dead in th for three and a half days in the streets. People look and on they come them. Back to life. And then right. they come back to life. And it looks heaven. like they're kind of raptured up to heaven. And other people are watching all of this. And that's the two witnesses. And then it ends. And then there's this seventh trumpet that blows. And the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and mm -hmm. ever. Mm -hmm. And that could be could be a central verse. You were telling me a little bit about Jim Hamilton saying structurally, maybe that's a, something you could explain here, uh, that that verse yeah, is sure. uh, highlighted so liter he, literarily. Yeah, and it might, might be worth mentioning. So he, he takes a, a view I hadn't really uh, heard about before. So he basically takes the two. So the uh, another big way to take the two witnesses is they're the church throughout history. You, you can kind of mention that. He he thinks that the, uh, the two witnesses are the church uh being persecuted, they're being, you know, conquered, uh, and then they're martyred, and then it's like the three and a half days is is the is the really intense tribulation period at the end, and then they come back to life, and that would coincide with the second coming, the rapture, of course, being the, the same event. They would go up and then come back down, and the events of chapter nineteen would happen. Now, some people, of course, think that these are like this. <clears throat> the 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 seals and the trumpets and the bowls are kind of this progressive parallelism. They're really at different sides of the same event because e each time it seems like John is taking us to the end. We have this intensification even in the seals and the trumpets and then of course the bowls. Um, you know, so that's that's his kind of that's his kind of take on it. Did I answer your question? Was yeah, there one more piece yeah, it's, to it? It's yeah. an interesting thing. So if, <clears throat> if that term was new to you, some people don't see Revelation as linear. They see it as cyclical. And it's actually not perfectly chronological. Everyone agrees with that. Your passage next week. Yeah, chapter 12, most people agree that's a flashback. So that's not... We have a, a longer interlude here. And it's not like the seals don't perfectly... Uh, the trumpets don't perfectly follow the seals and the bowls. There's a big long period before the bowls come. Right. So, so yeah. Okay. So progressive parallelism, that view is something you're going to highlight a little bit with the idealist perspective, I hope, next week. What that view is, is that there's these seven sections of Revelation and every single section starts with the beginning of the church and goes all the way to the end of the age. The world is over. And then the next section starts all over again. And it starts, this is the beginning of the church age all the way to the end of the church age. Okay, that section's over. And then we start again, the beginning of the church yep. age all the way to the end of the church age. And and Revelation does that seven different times and tells the same story of the church age mm -hmm. seven different times, although it continues to intensify every single time. And the focus on the end of the world continues to get more acute and more pronounced mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as it progresses. So that's why it's called progressive parallelism because it keeps on focusing in towards the very end as you get to the to the last seventh right. Right. section. So that's a so, different way to understand, very different way to understand the book. Right. So, and maybe, I don't know if this is the right time to bring this up, but we had talked about three different uh, interpretive issues last week. We spent most of the time on the rapture. 
But I also, in that first sermon on Revelation 6, introduced the ideas of the tribulation. There's different ways of understanding the tribulation and, of course, the 144,000, which maybe we can come back to that one in chapter 14 when they, they reappear. Um, but maybe you can show, you, you had a chart that you showed in the, so here's our chart sighting, in your message about two different ways to understand this um, this period of the Great Tribulation. Um, that chart's relevant. We'll talk about that for a second. So if you look at this section as already being fulfilled in the first century, you're a preterist. Right. If you look at the section as being fulfilled in the future, you're a futurist. Those are only two perspectives. Um, there's another chart, if you don't mind bringing it up, Tim, that has a timeline with just the three and a half year tribulation <clears throat> at the end of the timeline, which is like, uh, there's one way to see the timeline. I see that one. Let me, let me look for it. Okay, that's fine. So there's one way to see the three and a half year tribulation mm. at AD 70 and the year AD 66 to AD 70 is that chunk of time, the Great Tribulation. Mm -hmm. In your passage from last week in chapter 7, when it talks about the 144,000, right. it says Passing these through. are those who came right. out of the Great Tribulation. And it uses that term, the Great right. Tribulation. Right. Yeah, that's the one. There it is. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Tim. So some people see that three and a half year period, also known as 42 months, also known as 1260 days, also known as times, time, and half a time. So the times is two years, the time is one year, and then half a time is a half a year. So that's three and a half years. So some people see that fulfilled in the past, and then some people f see that fulfilled in the future. So, so, the, so the yeah. thing I was going to mention is there's another way of reading that if you want to go more of the symbolic direction. In, the, in that case, people see the tribulation period as beginning with Christ's um, ascension and going all the way through the church age, which is, if you're doing progressive parallelism, is usually what you take. The 1260 days is actually symbolic for the church age, and uh, the same thing with the 42 months and the times, times and a half. And, and there's that three and a half is half of seven. It's a broken seven. It's uh, a period of testing and trial. It's also... Um, uh, usually symbolizes that it's not God's final word. So there's still more to come uh, after that. Um, so that's another way of looking at it. And I'll, I'll actually probably spend more time on that view um, this week when I look at 12 and 13. So oftentimes numbers, words, um, images are symbolic in the book of Revelation. So right. in that view, the number three and a half is not literal. In right. that view, right. the number three and a half is a symbol, like you said, a broken seven. And it's not the first time that number has been used in the Bible. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. there's an incident in the intertestamental period where there's an evil ruler named Antiochus Epiphanes, who mm -hmm. was a Greek ruler, who persecuted the Jews for guess how long? Three and a half Three years. Three and a half years. So that was a memorable time. So people would remember that. Mm -hmm. And also the same period of time is found in the life of Elijah when he mm -hmm. brought a drought upon Israel right. for guess how long? Three and a half years. So because of that, the number could be being used symbolically to say this time of difficulty, this time of tribulation is three and a half years long. It's not a, mm -hmm. not, um, a literal three and a half years. It's referencing the whole church age. Amillennialists typically take it right. that way. I think sometimes historic pre-mills take mm -hmm. it that way. Yep. Uh, I might be forgetting, but that's another legitimate way to interpret. Yeah, and sometimes people break it up differently. So I, I've, heard, I've read people for the passage this week, 1260 days is connected with the nourishing and the wilderness, so that's the church age, and then the 42 months is when the beast conquers, so that's like the intensity at the end. So different people break it up different ways. Some people equate them all together, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that this coming week. So but, you're saying there could be two chunks of three and a half? That's what some people would one say. One of them's a longer chunk, the whole church age, and then one of them's like the shorter tribulation at the end. That's what I. There are right. some people that take that view. Yeah, there's yeah. different ways of combining it. Um, you know, what's interesting is you don't find the years like you don't find the seven year thing in Revelation at all. No, although Revelation uses the number seven like a zillion times. I don't know if that's true, but a lot of times. It's, it's a big number. But it never <laughs> refers to the tribulation as seven years long. In the book of Revelation, you can't find it. The only place you can go back to and see exactly the number seven years is Daniel 9, as he talks about the 70th week or the, you know, the last seven mm -hmm, years of mm -hmm. his prophecy. So unless you interpret Daniel 9 in a very specific way, saying the last week has to be catapulted into the eschaton, right. you have to insert a gap in between the 69th and 70th week to get there. 
if you don't interpret Daniel 9 that way, then it's very difficult to figure out where does the seven years thing come from. Right. So the only thing Revelation really refers to is that three and a half years. And so the rest of it is just sort of putting your system together like, oh, the three and a half years must fit together with Daniel's 70th week. And that's how we understand that. So a lot of things uh, go together. You interpret one passage one way. Now that has an inference that causes you to interpret another passage another way. And you're going to make these decisions along the way. And sometimes you have to rearrange the whole puzzle based on one way you're changing yeah. one piece of the puzzle. So, yeah. So anyway, I, I think, I think the, the number that. three and a half is probably is the more important number. And the question is, you know, in the Preterist view, was it the first century? In, in a certain Futurist view, is it a literal three and a half at the end? Or is it symbolic? Uh, so we'll talk more about that this week. Great. Yeah. One other interpretive issue I wanted to just mention, because I didn't get a chance to teach it, was from Revelation 11. There were so many things to talk about in Revelation 11 that I just kind of skipped. So what he does do in verses 7 and 8 is he refers to this particular city in a symbolic way. Uh, so I'll just read this um these two verses in Revelation 11, 7 to 8, it says this, and talking about the two witnesses, it says this, and when they had finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit, which by the way, we haven't even been introduced to the beast yet. Beast is coming this week, man. In chapter 13, but here he's, he's coming with the dragon. To, he's being referred to as um, already present here in chapter 11. The beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom in Egypt where their Lord was crucified. So here there's some city that is being called Sodom in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And it says that the city is the same city where their Lord was crucified. So people infer there that because Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem, or right outside the gates of Jerusalem, that what he's referring to here is the city of Jerusalem but he's calling it another name as a symbol. He's calling it Sodom, and he's calling it Egypt as a way of symbolically calling attention to the fact that Jerusalem's now being judged like a pagan city was judged mm -hmm. in the Old mm -hmm. Testament. It's not literally Egypt, not literally Sodom, but like the plagues came upon Egypt, like the fire and brimstone came upon Sodom, now this judgment is coming upon the city of God, the city of Jerusalem. And um, yeah. Shout out to my daughter, Michaela. She's at Cedarville University, and the parking is like a big issue there. There's a shortage. So they have this one lot that's really far away. It's a gravel lot, like across the way, and if you don't find a parking spot, you got to go all the way over there. And so sometimes she gets stuck over there. And the students at Cedarville call that Egypt. Oh, no, they call it Africa. They call it Africa. So well, Egypt is uh, in Africa. Yeah, it so. is, but they call it Africa. So sometimes Michaela will be talking to me. She's like, oh, I'm parked all the way in Africa. I'm like, what are you talking about? She's like, oh, there's this lot. It's really far away. Not literally Africa, but it's meant to you know, communicate something yeah. about the parking lot, that it's far. Just like that, John is communicating something about Jerusalem here by calling it Sodom, by calling it Egypt, by saying this once beautiful city of God, which was where the people of God dwelled, has now become the anti-city of God, the, the place where mm -hmm. God's mm -hmm. enemies are dwelling. And so he's coming yeah. to bring judgment upon them. That's good. Did you want to say anything about chapter 10? Chapter 10. More, more than what you summarized in the uh, in the message? There is a really interesting interlude with chapter 10. I will just say this. There's a little scroll. <laughs> I mean, there's always more mysteries to unpack with Revelation. Yeah. And we met this like wonderful, worthy lamb who could open the scroll of chapter 5. The big scroll. That that's the big scroll. But then there's a little scroll that shows up in chapter 10 that John is told to eat. And just like in the book of Ezekiel, when Ezekiel mm -hmm. ate the scroll, it was both bitter and both sweet, probably referring to the message of the gospel that brings both salvation and judgment. There's a hard edge mm. to the gospel, mm. right? It's That's good. It's the fragrance of uh, blessing to those who are receiving it, but it's also the, the fragrance of despair and destruction for those who reject it. So the... The ingesting of this little scroll is both sweet and, and bitter. And then there's a swearing, like almost like a legal courtroom scene here in chapter 10 where someone is taking an oath that these things will surely take place. They will come to pass. And then John hears seven thunders in his ears. 
And then he's told not to write down, don't write down the seven thunders. And so a lot of people have seen a reference there to Psalm 29, which has the voice of the Lord, which breaks the cedars, Mm. the voice of the Lord, which thunders. So there's seven thunders in Psalm 29. And so some people see an illusion there. But whatever it is, he doesn't write it down. He's told not to write it down. But he's told in an an assuring fashion that it will take place. So it seems like some sort of legal proceeding, some sort of courtroom proceeding. You have an Mm. oath. And then you have testimony, and then in chapter 11, you have witnesses being brought to the stand. Mm. And so because of that, like Dr. Kenneth Gentry says, this is an official legal proceeding, and he calls it the proceeding of the divorce of Israel, where God is separating himself out now from the people of Israel and connecting himself with a new bride, the bride of Christ, the new Jerusalem, which, of course, we are introduced to at the end of the book of mm, Revelation. Sure. So, so, so two, read chapter 10. Let me know what you think. I'd love to dialogue with you about Two other it. questions, and then we can be done with this. Uh, one, <laughs> one technical, one applicational. So I was going to ask you about the divorce of Israel. So what is that? Does that uh, affect the view of how church Israel is related um, in, the, in the preterist option? You know, some people does that hear... take move you more in a covenantal uh, direction? It could. Some people hear the word divorce, and it's like immediately, Mm -hmm. um, what are you talking about? You know, God doesn't allow divorce, and he doesn't allow married people to get divorced, and why would he ever issue a decree of divorce? And that that word itself can bring up a lot of pain and a lot of sort of visceral reactions to people. But actually, this is not the first time in the scriptures we read about something like this. in the book of Jeremiah, when they were being judged in a different season, right, um, and they were being conquered not by the Romans but by the Babylonians at that time, in Jeremiah chapter 5, God actually tells his people that he's going to issue them a certificate of divorce. And we, we read about that, which I think is kind of fascinating, that for a season, God is separating himself. But at that time, God says, I'm going to take you back. Um, in this case... Yeah, you can go either way. What 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 we don't want to say is that there's no hope for Jewish people or those who are ethnically Jewish. We don't want to say that. There's hope for Jew and Gentile, which is the same. Anyone mm-hmm. can accept mm-hmm. the gospel, um, and they come into into faith the same way the Gentiles would during the church age. Some people say uh, perhaps God is going to take Israel back. You have to read Romans 11 mm-hmm. a certain way. That says these are the natural branches that got broken off. Right. You're unnatural. Hey, be careful. Don't be arrogant. Uh, just like he broke off the natural ones, he could break off the unnatural ones too. And so some people see God taking Israel back sort of mm-hmm. at the end mm-hmm. of the age. And some people say, no, this is his conclusion of working in that dispensation uh, with the Jews. And now he's working in a new way with the church, which is not excluding the Jews, but in the new Israel the people of God in mm-hmm, Galatians chapter mm-hmm. three, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, you know, all these groups are now one Ephesians chapter two, right. he's breaking down the dividing wall and, right. and now he's working in this new people of God, the church. And there's a case to be made for that. There's a lot of language in the new Testament mm-hmm. that was previously applied to Israel. Like first Peter says now, it's Peter two, nine, you right. are, a chosen people you right. are now a royal priesthood you are now a um the kingdom that god is working through it's referring not to israel but right. to the church that's language directly from exodus 19 mm-hmm. that he's now applying to the jew gentile um you know organism that he's created i don't know if organism's the right word but the the church that he's created so some people take it different ways um it it could affect the way you see the future of Israel, or it, it may not. Um, you can you can have a couple different interpretive options. There. Okay, good. So, second question is uh, just what's the big takeaway here? What, what, how would you exhort people uh, in terms of how they live as we as we finish up the sermon section? The trumpet judgments are warnings, and I think even though this is a hard passage, even though this is a fearsome judgment by God Almighty. There's grace here. There's mercy here. The whole purpose of a trumpet is to issue the warning so that people would come back to him, so that people would repent. And so I think Mm. that's an an opportunity for us to look inside and say, where in my life right now is it possible that I still need to repent? Uh, You and I have talked about this um, Mm, many times, but 
the concept of you need to go deeper in your repentance. I think all the time we need to yeah. be looking a little deeper uh, to see where is God doing a work inside of us? Where do we need to repent? Where do we need to make ourselves right for the coming of the Lord? I think that's a challenge. The secondary application that I made yesterday was that no matter what comes, calamities, judgments, yeah. what no matter what uh, occurs on this earth, however difficult it might be, and these trumpets sound pretty difficult to endure, God's people stand, right? The question in Revelation chapter 6 is who can stand? The answer from Jesus mm -hmm. Christ is my people mm -hmm. can stand. My yeah. people are sealed by Christ. Yep. They are chosen by me, mm -hmm. and they are able to stand because God is able to make us stand. And here we stand. Like what has been able to knock out the church? Nothing. And they stand and, and sing. And God's people sing. You, you and, got people amening to singing, man. You know what? What's wonderful about Revelation is the worship songs. Mm -hmm. There's songs in almost every chapter where God's people are not just standing and grimacing. God's people are standing and singing. And so that was the challenge sort of at the end of that message. Like, yeah, whatever comes, I want you to sing, and I want you to sing in the enemy's face because the enemy knows that his defeat is coming and your victory is closer every single day. And so when difficulties come in your life, you sing and you sing in the enemy's face and you let him know, let the trumpets blast, let the demons swarm, and let the people of God sing. Come on. Come on. So it's a challenge for us. I'll say what I say every week. Tim was in the rafters. <laughs> was, oh yeah, he was swinging like a like a gorilla up. I was there. having a tea party up there, like uh, <laughs> like in Mary Poppins. Well, let me just transition to your sermon next week here. So, Revelation is about mm -hmm. worship. Mm -hmm. This is a book that is it's filled exactly with worship. And as we enter into chapter twelve and thirteen, mm -hmm. I think that we're going to discover there's only <clears throat> two options: either you are worshiping the Lamb, or mm. you're on another side. So the the give us a little, give the us a little parody teaser. of the Lamb, right? So there is a what people have called a satanic trinity in chapter twelve and thirteen, introducing the great red dragon, who is controlling these two beasts. There's there's a great scene if you read um, the 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 hinge between chapter twelve and thirteen, where the dragon goes and stands on the sand, and then it's like he summons these two beasts. I literally have pictures of Godzilla coming up from the sea and one beast from the land, and, and one is, is this kind of, you know, so it's almost, and they're, and they're mimicking the role of, of the Trinity, the true Trinity, you know, so you have the dragon who's kind of the head, and then you have the beast from the sea who mimics the lamb, mimics the second person, Christ, and then the false prophet who mimics the work of the Holy Spirit. And it really is ultimately about who are you going to are you going to worship the false trinity or the true trinity, and that's um, at, at the center of what we're going to look at this coming week. There's more to be said, but yeah, looking forward. And uh, we may or may not see a Barney the dinosaur sighting <laughs> based oh, man. on the dragon for the kids version. It's not the dragon. Some people somehow connect six 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 with Barney somehow. I, I, that was a weird thing I read this week, but apparently that's that's has been suggested. Well. You know, your sermon actually on this evil stuff comes the Sunday before Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. which I thought was interesting. So how scary are your pictures going to be yeah. here? Well, and also the first piece is very clearly connected with, um, you know, anti-Christian government. So we'll we'll see how that goes before the election. Tis the season. <laughs> wow. There you go. All right. Look forward to that. This will Don't be the second miss time. next week. <clears throat> Pastor Bob, that you're preaching on the dragon out of Revelation in the past oh, well, I'm gonna, months. I'm going to, the beast will come. And the title, I will give it away, Jesus is the Dragon Slayer. So that's what we're talking oh, about this it. week. Boom. There may or may not be a, a, a lightsaber that comes on the stage. We'll see. <laughs> you know you're having a good week when you have your sermon title ready on Monday oh, afternoon. Man. Oh, man. Well, we're, we're going to be away studying the book of Isaiah this week, so I had to work a little bit ahead. Um, but I do need to work on finishing to craft it. All right. So very good. Thank you so much, Pastor Day. Wonderful, wonderful message and expanding our minds. Uh, I think we've come to the time of... The show that oh, we yeah. call the Theology Sprint. Noah, they've been... already winded, but uh, they're going to make us run. Avoiding the sprint recently, my friend. Because the whole show has been a, a sprint. Well... A sprint after sprint. Well, Noah, I think... Noah's been... Si so, for those in our audience that don't know, sometimes uh, we were, were, we start recording this at like 12.30. Sometimes we have to record it at 8 a.m. Noah can't come those to those. The last two have been recorded at 8 a.m. So Noah's probably Noah. been sitting on this theology sprint for weeks. Oh, no. So it's Gotta been aged like Noah. a fine Cabernet. Got to work on getting Noah up earlier. <laughs> oh, 
man. Are we ready? Let's do it. It's going to be hard. All right, here we no, go. I doesn't think it's funny. He just, <laughs> come on, let's get after it. All right, so here's the question. In Exodus 20.13, the Bible says you shall not murder. Are there any instances in which it is permissible for a Christian to kill another human, such as if they were fighting in a war or acting in self-defense to save an innocent life? Well, that's a great question, Noah. Uh, there is such a thing called just war theory, so there's a whole lot of stipulations on how you uh, engage in a just war, um, and if you know that is the case, uh, generally people have agreed there's some permissibility there. Um, I'm not for, I'm not remembering all the different um, stipulations for that, but that that is is part of Christian thought, um, as well as self defense. Um, but yeah, I'm not remembering all the different arguments with that. Do you have yeah. any thoughts off the top of your head? I mean, I think death is part of the fall. This is yeah. never pleasing to God. I think we want to affirm the fact that this is a part of our condition in this world that's pernicious and uh, not the way it's supposed to be. Yet, at times, there is permission given by God to actually take another life. We're actually given the permission for capital punishment in Genesis chapter 9, where Mo uh, Noah mm -hmm. is... Uh, in order to protect the image of God, he says, if, if anyone is ever uh, violating uh, this principle and, and killing another person, then they should be killed. That's that's a capital punishment instituted in Genesis chapter 9, and that's for protection, really. Um, there's other instances in the Old Testament that uh, do show up, such as if, if um, a thief breaks into your house and um, that person... Uh, attacks you there's other uh, incidences here and there like david killing goliath that was obviously a permitted uh, act of war on 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 david's part in the old testament so from time to time the taking of another human life is permitted by god yet it is never pleasing uh to god uh augustine did come up with the the criteria for a just war um i i remember learning these in church history class when we went through um, you know, those, 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 that part of church history, I don't have those off the top of my head in theology sprint. Like, so this, this is probably something I could explain at another time, but I remember there's certain principles like, is this the last resort? Have right, you tried everything right. possible? Uh, is there non-combatant immunity? In other words, those that you're fighting with, uh, are, have to be a designated group, um, there's certain criteria that Augustine lined up, lined out that, that are helpful in making those kind of hard decisions. Generally speaking, I think we want to protect life and mm -hmm. do everything we possibly can to protect life. But I don't know. That's I think that's what we got, man. That's my answer for today. I'd have yeah, to go do, do, do a little bit more reading. Yeah. <laughs> but there are good answers. <laughs> that's the beauty of the theologians. The theology sprint, though, it's almost like the idea of someone coming up to you on the street being like, yo, can right. we kill people as Christians? Right. right. Like, oh, yeah. what's up with that? I have that? not been asked that question recently, so I haven't thought so about there you it in depth as we want to. All right. Can we move on to body life Thank now you, that we've yes. been through that? I was like passing through the tribulation line right there. Past <laughs> it <your> was. <laughs> the intensification. I felt it. Mm. <laughs> All right. So body life. Let's see what we got on here. Uh, good. So we have a new event that we're doing this year. Um, we're doing a packing party for City Relief. So this year, sadly, uh, we're not doing Winter Village. We're doing a Contend Conference. So we had to kind of pick and choose our resources. Um, so this is a really cool event because what we're going to be doing is coming together on Saturday morning, December 14th. We're going to feed you. Um, we're going to feed you uh, breakfast. I did notice that that graphic says 9 p.m. to 11 a.m. I got to make Mark change that. It's 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. It says a.m. Oh, p.m. to a.m. I see. 9 p.m. to 11 a.m. All nighter, folks. So we'll have you breakfast. Know, I saw your announcement twice yesterday, and I never noticed that. <laughs> I just there noticed it, it right. I missed it. Um, so anyway, breakfast. Then we'll. what we're going to do is pack hygiene kits. And this is especially cool if you have little kids. This can be a family serve event where you come out and and because kids can't go out on the bus to serve people on the street. Um, they have age restrictions. We're going to pack the hygiene kits. We're going to put them together and then we're going to send them off to City Relief. And then after we do that, we are going to have a presentation uh, from some people from the ministry. 
Now, so there's a couple things you can do here that we want you to do. Number one, we would love for you to come. So we're going to have a sign up link coming out to uh, soon. Second, uh, if you would like to donate, we would love to have donations to help uh, get the hygiene kits. Uh, rather than people bringing in random things, we're just going to put out a price tag. So each kit's going to be $10. Uh, and if you would like to buy several kits, uh, you can donate some money to help us um, get the kits uh, and have them all ready so that we can pack them up together. Uh, so we'll have information about that coming up very soon. But it's going to be a great event. It's a great time to, to serve at Christmas. And that's, uh, that's coming up on December the 14th. So mark your calendars. All right. Secondly, membership. Hey, this is really important. If you've been checking out NBC for a while, but you're wondering, hey, how does this work behind the scenes? How does Millington Baptist Church function and operate? And you're ready to take the next step to be a member of Millington Baptist Church and be part of our body and make a commitment uh, to our church, then attend this class. It's Wednesday night, October 30th, 630 to 930. Pastor Bob's going to be dropping all the knowledge at that class. We're looking forward to his exposition of all We don't need to spend Millington. much time on the eschatology section anymore, Pastor Dave. Yeah, people are like, we got that. Please move on. So um, <laughs> the class is important. Whether or not you're ready to take the step of membership, you'll need to take the class so that you have all the information that you need to make that decision. So that's kind of step one. Register. You need to go on our website and fill out the registration form so that we're prepared prepared for you to come. We can have materials and we can have refreshments ready for you and be able to set up appropriately. So we're looking forward to a great membership class this year. Uh, check it out. It's coming up very soon. Very cool. Uh, do you have another slide for anything else? Trunk or treat. Oh my goodness. That's coming up this Saturday, 3 to 5 p.m. Uh, we still need some people with cars to decorate them. So if you want to, like I said last week, make a make cookie monster out of your trunk or whatever you want to do with that, let Lenore know, sign up, uh, and if you're even if you're not doing a trunk show up, it's going to be a great Saturday. Lots of people will be out there. We will have VIP access for special needs from two starting at two thirty. So that's this coming Saturday, the twenty sixth. And then, uh, last but not least, uh, a reminder to sign up for our Contend Conference. I know that is further away, but we're looking to get signups now. We're hoping to get uh, 100 people signed up by December 31st to attend the conference. We got a capacity of uh, 250 in person, so we're looking to fill that up very quickly. Uh, Tim just dropped a wonderful video that he edited of myself and Delia Kang, uh, her interviewing me about what the Contend Conference is. And if I, if I could be so bold, Tim, I'm going to suggest right up here uh, oh yeah you, you put, you other put side a, other side over here you put a there link to that video you did so watch this this video to hear what the content it's, conference it might is be about. gone but now but it, it's there you okay. could have clicked on it if you didn't already Good. go go watch that video and sign up for the content conference it's going to be uh, amazing awesome all right and i think that's all we have to say today pastor dave we're I at 52 we've said enough we have said enough good we to be will. with you bob you thanks too thanks for hanging We'll be back next week talking about the dragon and the beasts. And maybe dropping some knowledge on the book and of Isaiah because we're going to hang we out. Are, we Tim are Mackey learning about week. Isaiah. Tim yes. Mackey's going to drop some truth bombs on Bible us. project guy. We're going to be we're going He's to see hanging him hanging out in Jersey and we're going to go see him. So we'll see you next week with our All right. uh, our newly found expertise on the prophet Isaiah. Hope we'll open the scroll of Isaiah. <laughs> or Deutero Isaiah I learned about already. Oh my gosh. <laughs> All right. We'll see you guys next week.